by the name Doug Papa? Yes, I do. God bless Doug Papa, an honest cop. I was elated, of course, but then as he testified, I was, I was somewhat concerned for him because I knew that they were probably going to crucify that man. The top cop who put his badge on the line for justice. One man who confronted truth and consequences. <laughs> One six nine ten means we got shots fired. Four fifteen a at the route to ninety one. Sounded like an automatic firearm. Copy, Covid at one six nine ten means you have shots fired. One six nine ten means it's coming from upstairs in the Mandalay Bay. Upstairs, Mandalay Bay, halfway up. I see the shots coming from Mandalay Bay, halfway up. Control, that is correct. Shots fired from Mandalay Bay. There's many people down. Stage left. Just be advised. Do we have anyone covering the southwest corner between Manly Bay and the venue? CP, I need eyes. Somebody in the CP, can you tell me where it is coming from? We're hearing it from Manly Bay. Somewhere in Manly Bay. It's at the intersection. It almost sounds like it's that close. It sounds like an elevated position that they got. 790 arrived. I'm going to form a strike team, Mandalay Bay and the Boulevard. I need five officers on me. We have multiple casualties, GSWs at the medical tent. Multiple casualties. From Mandalay Bay, it's getting a little bit more faint. 159 is coming from, like, the, uh, 50 or 60th floor north of the Mandalay Bay. It's coming out a window. What's happening, Sean? What's it's almost by 7 9 10 We'll see local flashes in the middle of Mandalay Bay on the north side, kind of a, on the west tower, but towards the center of the casino, like one of the middle floors. So if you're there, man, Officer Scott, Mandalay Bay, north down, right outside Route 91 is the south end. Is there a unit down? Three Mary 14. Three Mary 14. I'm inside the Mandalay Bay on the 31st floor. I can hear the automatic fire coming from one floor ahead, one floor above us. Copy. Is there a unit down? CP, just be advised, it is automatic fire, fully automatic fire from an elevated position. Take cover. That is correct. It's fully automatic fire. I'm right below it. Flashing coming up from about a third of the way up, center tower, Mandalay Bay. Control, we need all units to stop coming northbound on Las Vegas, Las Vegas Boulevard because he's shooting this way. It's a horrible cover spot. We're just north of Mandalay Bay Drive. We're east of the boulevard. we got about 40 to 50 people. We're pinned against this wall. Great. We're taking a gunfire. It's going right over our heads. There's debris coming over our heads. So we're pinned down here with a bunch of civilians. Okay, we can't worry about victims. We need to stop the shooter before we have more victims. Anybody have eyes on on this on this shooter? About 15 floor on the Mandalay Bay facing uh, off uh, the whole lot. My name is Doug Papa. I'm a former U.S. Army military policeman, former police officer, deputy sheriff, criminal investigator and spent 20 years in the hotel casino industry in Las Vegas as director of security at two properties. Prior to that, I was an investigator for the MGM Grand Hotel. I said that incompetence led to this massacre and the death of 58 people and the wounding and injuring. And, and people said, why do you say that? And I said, very simple. Number one, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, they coordinate all these festivals and concerts like this. The Route 91 Music Festival was almost on the corner of Tropicana and Las Vegas Boulevard. Right behind the Tropicana Hotel, Mandalay Bay's over there, um, Luxor over there, Excalibur over there, New York, New York across the street over there, MGM Grand across the street of, on Tropicana on the other side. Now, nobody from the command staff of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department ever thought that that outside venue opened up from the top could be vulnerable to an elevated sniper attack. Because that's happened 20, 30, 40 years in this country, elevated sniper attacks in this country. Nobody thought about that. And the reason why I say that is because had they had 
counter snipers available standing by, they could have responded very quickly and at least countered his fire, the gunman's fire, for coming out the windows to suppress it. That didn't happen. And I also blame the hotels. I spent 20 years in the hotel casino industry, not only as an investigator, but as director in security surveillance at two different properties. Since 9-11, every hotel casino in Las Vegas was advised by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security that their infrastructure is vulnerable to an active shooter incident or a Mumbai-type terrorist attack. And people say, well, what does that have to do with the gunman in the Mandalay Bay? Very simple. He rolled in 23 weapons, loaded magazines, thousands of rounds of ammunition, hundreds of magazines. The experts do say that they handled this calmly and professionally as they went into the gunman's room. That's the moment officers cleared the suite on the 32nd floor. Seconds later, officers find two spots where the gunman was shooting from. It's also immediately clear just how much firepower was stashed in the hotel room. Full suitcase full of loaded yeah. AK. I counted 13 long guns. Security expert Doug Papa says the several person strike force did a good job handling a tense situation professionally. It was very chaotic that night. There was a lot of craziness going on. People were yelling over the radio. They didn't know where the shoot was coming from. Amid conflicting reports, after searching the room, it becomes more clear this was the only spot shots were coming from. I'm thinking this is just a one guy thing. So, but what about all the other calls? Is that just people panicking people and freaking panicking. out? Or, yeah, it like it. When they hit that door, they didn't know if they were going to be facing one guy or 20 guys with assault weapons and they would have been dead. So they went in, they did what they had to do. Papa says his only criticism was wondering why it took such a long time for crews to breach the hotel room door. You go in. I mean, that's what you do. You don't, you know, you don't wait in the hall. You don't wait outside. You go in. That's what they train to do. But, but that's something I'm sure they looked at on, on after incident briefings and, and debriefings and stuff like that. Now, Papa says, of course, he also wants to commend the officers who were on the ground at the festival that night, who he says saved lives. Now Good evening, ladies and gentlemen from Las Vegas, Nevada. This is Truth and Consequences with Doug Papa, episode 59 for Sunday, August 8th, 2021. This is another exclusive investigative report. The interview clips of me that you just saw were from movie director Charlie Min's documentary titled One October, A Nightmare in Las Vegas. I was interviewed in late 2017 by Charlie Min and his documentary was subsequently released in March of 2018. The KTNV TV 13 Action News segment aired on May 3rd, 2018. On October 1st, 2017, the worst mass shooting in modern American history occurred in Las Vegas, Nevada, resulting in the death of 60 people. Hundreds of others suffered gunshot wounds and other physical and emotional injury. The Las Vegas massacre was a sniper attack from an elevated position from a hotel high-rise tower, the MGM Resorts International-owned Mandalay Bay Hotel and Casino. Gunman Stephen Paddock fired from his 32nd floor suite down into the crowd of 22,000 concert goers at the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival, firing for over 10 minutes, unimpeded. According to police sources who spoke to me in 2018, six years prior to the Las Vegas massacre, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department conducted a training scenario that was strangely similar to the October 1, 2017 sniper attack from an elevated position. Also in attendance during that training scenario, according to police sources, were some members of the Las Vegas hotel and casino security industry, including an MGM corporate security executive. On May 4, 2018, I broke the story for the Baltimore Post Examiner that was titled, FBI's Elite Hostage Rescue Team and the Las Vegas Metro Police Trained for a Similar Mass Shooting Scenario Years Before. On September 29, 2018, the Baltimore Post-Examiner published exclusive MGM Resorts International Executive knew that a sniper attack from a hotel high-rise posed a threat prior to October 1st massacre. Both of my stories were ignored by the mainstream media. The FBI, the Las Vegas Metro Police, and MGM Resorts International never returned my request for comment on the training scenario. On November 2nd, 2017, 
One month after the Las Vegas massacre, Sheriff Joseph Lombardo, who runs the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, was interviewed on KLAS-TV, 8 News Now in Las Vegas. Lombardo told 8 News Now reporter George Knapp, quote, It's important for us to try and what if every scenario. This was a scenario we hadn't envisioned. That statement was false. The scenario was envisioned. The following year, on June 26, 2018, Lombardo appeared on KSNV-TV, News 3 Las Vegas. Lombardo made the following statement about the October 1, 2017 Las Vegas massacre. Quote, This particular incident, nobody could particularly train for this exact scenario. Nobody can envision this scenario. Once again, Lombardo made a statement to the local news that was not true. This particular incident, as Lombardo described the Las Vegas massacre, was considered, it was envisioned, and it was trained for. Here are the excerpts from Sheriff Lombardo's interviews on 8 News Now in November of 2017 and News 3 Las Vegas in June of 2018. So you can what if to the cows come home, George, and it's important for us to try and what if every scenario. Uh, and this was a scenario that we hadn't envisioned. And now it's in our repertoire as far as responding to it. Up and tonight we spend a half hour with Sheriff Joe Lombardo. History's Jeff Gillen on what we can expect. Tonight we sit down with the sheriff and we begin with a night this city will never forget. It is, of course, October 1st, the night of America's worst mass shooting. Particular incident. Nobody could particularly train for this exact scenario. Nobody could envision this 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 scenario. The FBI's hostage rescue team, HRT, the Las Vegas Metro Police, including the SWAT team, participated in a training scenario simulating a sniper attack from an elevated position prior to the Las Vegas massacre. And I will have more on that in a few minutes. I authored approximately 165 articles on the Las Vegas massacre, more than any other investigative journalist in the country that were published by the Baltimore Post Examiner at the time. We broke one story after another. Most, if not all, like I said before, were ignored by the mainstream media. No brag, just fact. Many times in those articles, I stated that the Las Vegas massacre was in part the result of incompetence, ignorance, and negligence by Las Vegas Metro Police Command Staff and MGM Resorts International, and backed up everything I wrote with facts. Despite the fact there are still many unanswered questions, there has never been an independent inquiry into the Las Vegas massacre. We still hear about Columbine, Sandy Hook, and other mass shootings, but for some reason, the Las Vegas massacre, the worst mass shooting to date, has pretty much disappeared from the mainstream media. Sheriff Joseph Lombardo and his then undersheriff, Kevin McMahill, made many false statements to the media relating to the October 1st, 2017 Las Vegas massacre. They were never held accountable. Now, let's get to the training scenario. The following excerpts are derived from the two 2018 articles that I authored for the Baltimore Post Examiner that I described earlier. Later, in this podcast, I will have new information that I obtained after those stories were published that further corroborates what I was told by my police sources three years ago when I broke those stories. Now, listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. A training exercise conducted by the FBI's elite hostage rescue team, HRT, and attended by members of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department was eerily similar to the sniper attack from an elevated position that occurred on October 1, 2017 at the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas, according to law enforcement sources. Sometime after the Sahara Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas closed in May of 2011, and prior to renovations to transform the property into the then SLS resort, the property was used for a training exercise conducted by the FBI and attended by Las Vegas Metro Police personnel. I was told that during the training exercise, a mannequin was placed inside one of the high-rise tower rooms near a window, 
to simulate an attacker. An FBI hostage rescue team sniper inside an FBI helicopter hovering over the Las Vegas Strip successfully made the shot and hit the mannequin. According to the law enforcement sources who spoke to me, then Claw County Sheriff Doug Gillespie was unaware that the FBI maneuver was going to be part of the exercise and was livid when he found out what happened. A former ranking member of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department told me that MGM Resorts International Executive Director of Corporate Security and Surveillance, Tom Lozich, knew prior to the October 1st, 2017 massacre that a sniper attack from an elevated position in a hotel high-rise posed a threat. Lozich is a retired deputy chief with the Las Vegas Metro Police. In 2008, he was hired by MGM Mirage Corporation, now known as MGM Resorts International. According to the high-ranking police source, Lozich, while employed at MGM, was present during the training exercise at the Sahara Hotel when the FBI sniper shot at a target placed inside a window simulating a sniper attack at a hotel high-rise. I was the first and I believe the only investigative journalist to date to question in several stories why law enforcement didn't consider the possibility that a sniper attack from an elevated position might be a threat to a crowd of thousands who were in an open-air concert venue that was surrounded by hotel high-rise towers in all directions. I also made that comment in 2017 when I was interviewed by Charlie Min, as you saw in that interview clip at the start of this podcast. Similar comments were echoed again when I interviewed former U.S. Navy SEAL Matt Bracken in May of 2018 for one of my stories. Quote, This was an entirely foreseeable and preventable massacre, Bracken said. The prior FBI HRT exercise proved this scenario had been considered. A police helicopter with a SWAT sniper should have been ready to go. The airborne sniper could have stopped Paddock after the first couple of minutes, saving dozens of lives and preventing the panic stampede. For that matter, counter snipers on the ground could have fired into the broken out windows <clears throat> to force Paddock back into the room and stopped him from flying down onto the concert. Matt Bracken's comment was very interesting because I later broke the story that law enforcement sources told me that on the night of the October 1st, 2017 massacre, after Stephen Paddock stopped firing and prior to the Las Vegas Metro Police ad hoc team of one SWAT officer and patrol officers entered Paddock's suite, one hour after the last shots were fired, mind you, a Las Vegas Metro Police SWAT team sniper did deploy from a police helicopter, albeit far too late. I was told in 2018 that Metro Police SWAT sniper J.R. Brown and his spotter were inside the police helicopter with a rifle equipped with optics capable of looking in the, in the room and asked the pilot to get as close as possible to the broken out window in Paddock's 32nd floor suite. However, the pilot refused because he was unsure if anyone in the room would start firing again and endanger the aircraft. In 2018, Sheriff Lombardo and his undersheriff, Kevin McMahill, told the press that there was no hurry making entry into, making entry, excuse me, into Paddock's 32nd floor Mandalay Bay Hotel suite because the situation was contained after Paddock stopped firing. Waiting over one hour to make entry into Paddock's suite that night was unacceptable. Nobody knew if firing would start again. The police weren't even sure Paddock was still in the room. Excuse me, that anyone was still in the room. It goes against police protocol on active shooter incidents. When I interviewed Navy SEAL Matt Bracken, he said that it was a tactically poor decision and could have led to the death and wounding of more people. Quote, It was still an active shooter incident whether he was firing at that time or not, Bracken said. It's not a contained situation, until they got their boot on his neck, and the room has been cleared for sure. When Sheriff Lombardo was interviewed by KLAS-TV 8 News Now in November of 2017, Lombardo said that they wanted to get into Paddock's suite because they didn't want him opening fire again or reloading magazines. If Lombardo's statement to 8 News Now was true, then why did the police wait over one hour to make entry into Paddock's suite? How long does it take for someone to open fire again and or reload magazines? An hour? Give me a break. 
What if Paddock had opened fire again into the crowd? Would the police have gone in after more people were being, were, excuse me, were in the process of being killed and wounded? Lombardo's comments were idiotic, to say the least. Lombardo also said during the 8 News Now interview that if Paddock had continued firing, they would have gone in immediately. During that November 2, 2017 interview, Lombardo did not mention that while Paddock was firing, killing and wounding dozens of people, two of his police officers, along with three armed Mandalay Bay Hotel security supervisors, were one floor below Paddock's suite, and they failed to take any action to reach the 32nd floor and attempt to stop Paddock, while they all knew people were being slaughtered across the street from the Mandalay Bay Hotel at the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival. At the opening of this podcast, you heard Las Vegas Metro Police radio traffic during the massacre. The police officer who identified himself as 3 Mary 14 on the radio and told the police dispatcher that he was one floor below it was Cordell Hendricks, one of the police officers I just described who retreated on the 32nd floor, excuse me, the 31st floor, and took no further action as people were being killed and wounded. One month after the massacre, Sheriff Lombardo knew damn well about Hendricks' inaction, but conveniently failed to mention it during the 8 News Now interview. I'm not going to get off track here about the incompetency of Sheriff Lombardo. I will do that in future podcasts, being that Lombardo is under the misconception that he has what it takes to be the next governor of Nevada. Sure, incompetence, corruption, cover-ups, and lies are his qualifications. And Lombardo's undersheriff at the time of the Las Vegas massacre, Kevin McMahill, who wants to be the next sheriff of Clark County, Nevada, he is a Lombardo clone. Many times, Lombardo and McMahill sacrificed the truth for image while talking to the local and national media. Taking into consideration that both Lombardo and, and McMahill are running for public office, I will have much more on their false statements and cover-ups in future podcasts, some relating to the Las Vegas massacre. Now, let's move forward to new information that I was unaware of when I authored those articles back in 2018 that further corroborates what my sources told me back in 2018 about the FBI training scenario. When I wrote the story on the FBI's hostage rescue team training scenario in 2018 at the Sahara Hotel, my sources couldn't remember the exact date that it occurred, but I was told it was part of a larger exercise. Subsequently to that, I obtained a confidential internal Las Vegas Metro Police email that confirmed the date that the training scenario did take place. Please refer to the screenshot. The Las Vegas Metro Police email dated September 29, 2011, was from Dean Hennessy, Support Operations Bureau, Alternate Police Operations Planning, MACTAC, which is an acronym for Multi-Assault Counterterrorism Action Capabilities. Hennessy sent the email to then-Captain Todd Fasulo. Subject, Scenario. Captain, we are having a large-scale MACTAC SWAT scenario at the Sahara Hotel and Casino on Wednesday the 21st. We just wanted to let you know so you could pass this along to your troops. If you have any questions, please contact me and I will make sure they get answered. Thanks, Dean. Now, take a look at the Baltimore Post Examiner story on the FBI training scenario. That photograph that was used that depicted a helicopter with an FBI hostage rescue team member holding a rifle on the external platform was an FBI photograph that was obtained off the internet at the time. A few weeks ago, I watched an FBI promotional video on the hostage rescue team that is based out of Quantico, Virginia. The video was posted by the FBI on YouTube in 2013. Now, in a minute, I will play the FBI video. The runtime is four and a half minutes. There is an eight second clip of that same helicopter depicted in the Baltimore Post-Examiner photograph. It's the FBI HRT helicopter hovering over the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas with the Sahara Hotel clearly defined with two HRT riflemen on both sides of the helicopter sitting on the shooting platforms. At the end of the FBI video, I will play the eight-second clip multiple times again for further clarity. 
As the video pans to the upper left portion of the screen, clearly visible are silhouette targets on the roof of the Sahara Hotel parking garage, simulating an attacker from an elevated position. The video does not show the FBI shooting into one of the Sahara Hotel high-rise towers, as I was told happened, apparently because it's only an eight-second clip of the entire training scenario that I have no doubt was fully recorded by the FBI and or the Las Vegas Metro Police. Whether the FBI will ever release the entire training video is anybody's guess. Now, here is the video, and then I'll have a few closing comments. dive operations, subsurface delivery, waterborne, a full range of overland mobility, meaning we can go overland through the desert, uh, you know, arctical weather terrain with uh, the snowmobiles, four-wheelers. We have gun trucks and all sorts of other platforms that allow us to access pretty much any environment here in the United States.
Now we know that the FBI training scenario occurred in September of 2011. After watching the video that was produced by the FBI, there is no doubt that the training scenario took place at the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas. In that video, you saw the silhouette targets that were placed on the roof of the Sahara Hotel parking garage, simulating an attacker from an elevated position. I am highlighting that because, if you recall, in July of 2016, a sniper attack from an elevated position in a parking garage in Dallas, Texas, left five police officers dead and seven other persons wounded. That was over a year prior to the Las Vegas massacre. The FBI training scenario at the Sahara Hotel occurred six years prior to the 2017 Las Vegas massacre. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. In addition to everything I just described, on November 29, 2014, a housekeeping attendant entered a room in one of the hotel high-rise towers of the Mandalay Bay Hotel, and according to court documents, noticed a rifle with a scope lying on the floor pointing towards the Las Vegas Strip. Security was contacted, and the Las Vegas Metro Police responded. A convicted felon, Kai Aaron Dunbar, and his wife were occupying the room. The police confiscated a homemade suppressor, commonly referred to as a silencer, three handguns, two two twenty three caliber semi-automatic rifles, and a 7.62 NATO caliber bolt-action rifle. No doubt, MGM Resorts International Corporate Security knew about this incident as it occurred on their property, as did the Las Vegas Metro Police and the FBI, who were involved in the investigation. Less than three years later, Stephen Paddock brought 23 firearms and thousands of rounds of ammunition into his Mandalay Bay Hotel high-rise tower suite and initiate a sniper attack from his elevated position down into the concert venue, resulting in the worst mass shooting in modern American history. Keep in mind that the first Route 91 Harvest Music Festival was in October of 2014. MGM Resorts International owns the festival grounds and sponsored the events, which was coordinated with the Las Vegas Metro Police. That first music festival in 2014 premiered five years after the 2011 training scenario at the Sahara Hotel and two years after the cache of weapons were found in one of the Mandalay Bay Hotel high-rise tower rooms. And yet, no counter-snipers were ever deployed at the 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2017 Route 91 Harvest, excuse me, Harvest Music Festivals. No measures were ever taken before and during any of the Route 91 Harvest Music Festivals to mitigate a possible sniper attack from an elevated position. Counter-snipers were never on standby in the area. Nobody in the command structure of the Las Vegas Metro Police ever thought outside the box that a sniper attack from a hotel high-rise tower could be a potential threat. Not only were the Las Vegas Metro Police and the FBI aware that a threat existed from an elevated sniper attack in a hotel high-rise, hence the training exercise, but there was also an MGM Resorts International corporate security executive present during that training scenario. Why wasn't this threat a concern by MGM Resorts International during the planning stages of all the Route 91 Harvest Music Festivals? Like I said, the concert venue property is owned by MGM Resorts International, and the venue is surrounded by hotel high-rise towers. The MGM Resorts International Vice President of Security, Surveillance, and Safety for the Mandalay Bay Hotel the night of the massacre was retired FBI Supervisory Special Agent George Tagliati, who had that position since 2007. The Mandalay Bay Hotel Director of Security the night of the massacre was a retired major with the Nevada Highway Patrol, Kevin Tice, who held that position since 2014. If you recall from my interview with Charlie Min at the start of this podcast, I said that the Las Vegas hotel security industry was advised numerous times after September 11, 2001, by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security that the Las Vegas infrastructure, excuse me, infrastructure was vulnerable to an attack. 
I know that for a fact because I attended many of the seminars that were provided free of charge by the Department of Homeland Security to the hotel industry, and as a director of security, I was privy to the many bulletins and alerts from the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security that also raised those concerns. Many unclassified for official use only government documents made their way onto the internet, including the following two that I will talk about here as an example. Here is an excerpt of one such bulletin that was issued by the FBI and Homeland Security on December 19, 2016, titled Joint Special Event Threat Assessment. That was almost a year prior to the Las Vegas massacre. Quoting from the, uh, the report, The FBI and DHS remain concerned about the sustained interest by terrorists, listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, and criminals in targeting mass gatherings, individuals to conduct independent attacks using small arms on soft targets such as music venues. Unaffiliated lone offenders are of particular concern due to their ability to remain undetected until operational. Their willingness to attack soft targets, their ability to inflict significant casualties with weapons that do not require specialized knowledge, access, or training. Ladies and gentlemen, that is an eerily similar description of Stephen Paddock and his actions on October 1st, 2017. Paddock was a lone offender, as far as we know. Paddock targeted a mass gathering. Paddock used small arms. Paddock attacked a soft target, a music venue. Paddock remained undetected until he became operational and fired out the window from his 32nd floor suite. Paddock inflicted significant damage with weapons. Now, one more example. This one from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, titled Homeland Security Threat Assessment, Evaluating Threats, 2008 to 2013. This also was issued prior to the Las Vegas massacre. Quoting, Lone wolves producing limited local physical damage. Sniping and shooting sprees are highly effective terror tactics that do not require extensive training or financial resources. Online training and weapons could be used in an attack are readily available, providing lone wolves the resources to execute such attacks. Need I say more, ladies and gentlemen, on those examples that were also representative of other bulletins that were made available to Las Vegas hotel security personnel and the police prior to the 2017 Las Vegas massacre. When I was writing my stories on the Las Vegas massacre, I was told by police sources that for years prior to the 2017 massacre, that in Las Vegas on New Year's Eve during the closure of Las Vegas Boulevard, Las Vegas Metro Police SWAT snipers were deployed along the Strip to protect the hundreds of thousands of tourists who fill the streets. One police source told me that the question came up many times at the Las Vegas Metro Police, quote, what do we do if someone starts shooting from one of the hotel windows down into the crowd? Stephen Paddock fired unimpeded for 10 minutes. Would things have turned out differently had there been police snipers on standby that could have responded to counter Paddock's fire and thus reduce the casualties? We will never know because they were not there. After all the training scenarios, prior incidents, warnings from the FBI and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and just plain common sense, nobody in the police department under the command of Sheriff Joseph Lombardo, made a decision that could have saved lives on the night of October 1st, 2017, by having counter snipers standing by in the area. As one police officer told me, foresight is priceless, hindsight is 2020. We seem to learn the hard way in this country. It is extremely sad that nobody at the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and MGM Resorts International, with all their retired, high-ranking law enforcement security executives that were involved with the planning of any of the Route 91 Harvest Music Festivals, thought outside the box. 
that just maybe the concert venue could be vulnerable from a sniper attack from an elevated position. It was nothing short of incompetence, complacency, ignorance, and negligence on part of all. The October 1st, 2017 Route 91 Harvest Music Festival had a catastrophic effect on human lives, and that is something you could never put a price on. In future episodes, I will expose more Sheriff Lombardo cover-ups, a few which are related to the Las Vegas massacre. We are quickly approaching the fourth anniversary of that terrible night. October 27th this year will also be the five-year mark on the unsolved double homicide of Sidney Land and Nehemiah Kaufman. That case, as I have reported on exclusively for over two years, is surrounded with allegations of police corruption, negligence, and incompetence by Las Vegas Metro Police detectives. Many of those allegations were made by now former Las Vegas Justice Court Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiasen, who told me back in 2018 that the police had all the evidence to make arrest in the case, that there was a cover-up, and that the police probably destroyed evidence. Thanks for listening, folks.